You're listening to the Greek's Gridiron, live with Ethan Haristadoulou. Welcome back, everybody, to more of the Greek's Gridiron. I am Ethan Haristadoulou, and today we continue on with our offensive power ranking series, diving into none other than the AFC South, a division that has a lot of transition going on this offseason with a lot of new faces and a lot of new places, so plenty to discuss. Make sure you comment down below. Let me know your rankings for the AFC South offenses who do you have at the top who do you have at the bottom who are you sandwiching there in between those two teams what am I getting right what am I getting wrong I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions on all of it but diving right into it we'll begin with the bottom team at number four a team that is going through I would argue the most transition out of every single team within the AFC South and that is the Houston Texans at number four now This one, having them at four, I'm going to say very tight competition between them and the number three team without spoiling who they are. I was very much kind of like 50-50 weighing my options here, but ultimately I gave the number three team a little bit of an edge because I think there's just a little bit more talent in the cabinet for the number three team. But when you look at the Texans, you have a new system coming in with a new head coach, new offensive coordinator in D'Amico Ryans and offensive coordinator Bobby Slowick taking over an offense that was 31st in both points and yards per game last season. Bobby Slowick being very clear with his ideas and ideology that he'll be working with for this team being aggressive, fast, and decisive. Now, with that in mind, looking at this entire team, you of course have incoming quarterback, rookie, C.J. Stroud of Ohio State, someone with a lot of promise who has gotten a lot of praise in a lot of his game with some criticisms here and there, but somebody who I think is a really good fit for this team. Now, surrounding him is going to be where the real questions come into play, and can this talent that is around him play to the level that they're hoping C.J. Stroud is going to be able to play for, starting with the upside slash uncertainty that you have as far as pass catchers go. Looking at the wide receiver room, Here are the people that you can kind of look at as the premier targets, I guess you could say. Obviously, we have wide receiver John Mechie III, who's coming off of a battle with leukemia. It sounds like he's going to be able to suit up and play this year, and he's getting set and getting basically ready to roll as soon as training camp kicks off. Considered a first-round pick before his ACL injury that ended his final collegiate season, this is kind of a sleeper guy for me, someone that I think as long as he can come back from that ACL injury ready to go, and that's, you know, that's well and far behind him at this point now, and he's... You know, as far removed from the effects of his battle with leukemia, this is someone that I'm circling as like a player to watch type candidate, someone who I think could surprise a lot of people and someone who had a lot of hype behind him going into his final season of college before tearing that ACL. Then you, of course, have veterans in Robert Woods, Nico Collins, Noah Brown, who was brought in this offseason. I think you have a decent mix of guys here with a lot of talent that you could work with here, but it ultimately just boils down to what do you have at your wide receiver spot and who is going to build the the best rapport with quarterback CJ Stroud. Then you also have at the tight end spot, a nice addition in Dalton Schultz workhorse for Dallas the last three seasons. He had nearly 200 receptions for 2000 yards on the dot and 17 touchdowns. I think a fantastic upgrade at the tight end spot for them. But again, it really just boils down to how is the rapport going to build between CJ Stroud and all of these potential receivers that he's going to have to work with here. On the offensive line, you're looking at a group that added both Shaq Mason and center Juice Scruggs from Penn State in the second round of this year's draft. Two guys that I think massively upgrade this offensive line. You, of course, have Laramie Tunsil on the left side there, signing his contract extension for three years. You have Kenyon Green, who's a first-round selection. Titus Howard, who's a first-round selection. There's a lot of really good things to like about this offensive line, and I think it's a group that might surprise a lot of people here. And then a running back room with Damian Pierce and adding Devin Singletary. Again, a lot of potential upside. Damian Pierce looked really good last season, and I think Devin Singletary will make an excellent one-two punch combination here. But ultimately, it's just a lot of transition, a whole new system, a lot of potential upside, but a lot of uncertainty to go along with it all. Hence why I have the Texans sitting at number four. Going into the number three team, but like I said, this is a team that I gave just a very slight edge to just because I feel like you have a little bit more proven talent already within the system that you have going on over there, and that's going to be the Indianapolis Colts at number three. Now, I'm a Colts fan, so as I break this down here, I'm going to try to be as unbiased as possible as I'm going to be with the rest of the teams in this division as well. Biases aside... I will say that this is probably the best fit for Anthony Richardson as far as a team goes. When the Colts went and hired Shane Steichen, my first thought was, okay, Anthony Richardson fits to a T 
very similarly what he was doing with Jalen Hurts over in Philadelphia. And if there's one guy that I wanted the Colts to go after and get, I understand he's very raw, but he has that same skill set with the athleticism, very big arm, really excited to see what he can do. Obviously not exactly the same player. He is a monster of a man, Jalen Hurts, beast in his own right, but not quite the size of Anthony Richardson. And I would say Anthony Richardson, far more raw coming out of college, but a lot of things that you can like in terms of just physicals, athleticism, and skill set that kind of match up with what he's used to in Philadelphia. On top of that, you have Jonathan Taylor, stud running back, had a bit of a down year last year. He only played in 11 games, under 1,000 yards rushing, only had four touchdowns. And this is coming off of a season prior where he went 2,000 yards over at, from the line of scrimmage. He had 20 touchdowns. He was averaging five point yards per carry. This is, again, a, a running back who, despite what the running back room might look behind him with like Zach Moss, you still have Deion Jackson. There's a lot of uncertainty there with what's going on behind him. Evan Hall coming in as well. I still believe that Jonathan Taylor is a top three running back in the NFL when he's healthy and playing behind a good offensive line in what I think the Indianapolis Colts should see improvement on this season. So I'm very excited to see how he fares and how he makes things easier for the rookie quarterback, Anthony Richardson. And speaking of the offensive line, this is a group that kind of needs to get back to their previous dominant form. Sounds like Ryan Kelly, their center, is a little bit more reinvigorated this season. And I feel like there was a lot of just issues with health and trying to find the correct rotation on the offensive line last year. And it seems like they kind of figured it out towards the back half of the season. So I'm hoping with that, it'll transition into this next year. And we not not saying get back to the dominant offensive line we saw in like 2019, 2020 timeframe. But even if you can just work your way back in that direction, would would be ideal, but I mean, Bernard Raymond's going to have his second season in the system now. A healthy Quentin Nelson will go a long way as well. I'm excited to see the offensive line this year. We have Will Fries, who sounds like he's going to be getting more of an opportunity at the right guard spot. So looking forward to seeing the offensive line improve, and that's kind of my expectation for them this year. It would be a real awful thing to see them regress. This is a, a, a group that should, in theory, be progressing this season. And then the wide receiver room, this is kind of where I really gave the edge over the Houston Texans here. You have a group that is far more proven with what you have and has been there so far. I like Alex Pierce and his potential upside, but I do want to see more from him this year. This is a season where he needs to take quite a leap, and I'm hoping he can build a nice rapport with Anthony Richardson. Michael Pittman needs to have another big season. I'm talking like 100-plus receptions. If he's that number one guy and he wants to get paid like that number one guy, 100 receptions plus, 1,000-plus yards, and I want to see him close to double-digit touchdowns. Touchdown. So if he can get even just 8, 9, 10, something like that, I would be happy. But I want to see him get true number one wide receiver numbers there if he is going to get paid by the Colts like that. And then there's, of course, Isaiah McKenzie, who what he did in Buffalo, very exciting to me. I think he sparked a really good little bit of energy in the New York Giants offense last year during the back half of the season once he ended up over there. So I'm excited to see what Isaiah McKenzie can do here in Indianapolis. Very similar I would say to like how I saw them use and utilize T.Y. Hilton. So I'm hoping to get some of that out of McKenzie. And then tight end Jelani Woods. This is a season where he needs to step up and become the legit tight end one. At this point, I feel like it's kind of his job to lose. He looked solid last year in the limited action that we saw, but he's 6'7". He's 265. He has a ton of athleticism, a ton of potential upside. And I think a tight end who could be a very reliable security blanket for somebody like Anthony Richardson. The size mismatch on him and the athleticism he boasts as well is pretty high. So this is someone that Anthony Richardson can really look forward, look forward to throwing to as kind of a comfort guy. Now with the Colts at number three, we have two teams, the Titans and Jaguars remaining here. Now I'm going to go with at the number two spot, the Tennessee Titans, and I will get into the Jaguars at number one in just a moment here, but here's why I have the Titans at number two. And I'm going to start things off by talking about Mike Vrabel. I argue, and again, I'm a Colts fan here saying this, I think he is one of the best head coaches in the NFL. I don't think many people get quite as much out of what they have in their cupboard than Mike Vrabel does. And he has won his share of head coach of the year award. And I think that he's somebody who people sometimes for whatever reason overlook because maybe the Titans have coming off a bad, or not bad year, well, you know, so, so year, not great. Um, people forget just how good of a coach he actually is. I mean, he won head coach of the year just a couple of seasons ago. So I can never sit here and doubt the Titans as long as Mike Vrabel is coaching this team here. Secondly, Derrick Henry 
coming off of a strong season. I feel like a lot of people forget just how dominant he is, even though he had like, it, last year was a good season. It was by no stretch a bad season. It was actually his best season in terms of receiving production. He averaged 5.1 yards per touch altogether. That's between carries and receptions last year. Made a massive contribution in the passing game. Again, his best of his career were 33 catches, nearly 400 yards. He had coming off a second most career high of 382 career rushes, or excuse me, not career rushes, season rushes. So he's once again tasked with being the dominant workhorse that he's been, and I don't really see any reason for him to slow down. You couple that with the fact that the Tennessee Titans clearly knew they needed to rework their offensive line, and they did so. They brought in Peter Skaronsky from Northwestern in the first round. On top of that, you brought in offensive guard Daniel Brunskill, for, uh, yeah, Brunskill from San Francisco in free agency. There is a clear there was a clear issue with the O-line. They went and addressed it. I think that's going to open things up even further for Derrick Henry to continue to dominate the league like he has been. I mean, I don't understand how some people seem to forget just how dominant he was. Yeah, he's not rushing for 2,000 yards again or nearly 2,000 yards in back-to-back -back seasons, but I mean, his production last season crossed like 1,700 yards from scrimmage or was close to it, something along those lines. It might even have been more, but... I still believe in what they do with the run game. I think the commitment to the improvement of the offensive line is going to be huge for this team. It really just comes down to quarterback. Is it going to be Will Levis out of the gate? Is it going to be Ryan Tannehill? It sounds like it's going to be Ryan Tannehill. Uh, reports are that Malik Willis is beating out Will Levis in camp. So if you you know you take that for what you will, but if it's going to be Ryan Tannehill, you at least have the veteran, the guy who's experienced and been with this offense here. I know that there's questions about him kind of folding when the bright bright lights are on him, but ultimately, uh, you can't really deny what Ryan Tannehill has done in terms of just stability for the quarterback's position in Tennessee since he's gotten there. So even if maybe he's not quite tearing it up like the first couple of seasons when he first got there, I still trust him as a steady veteran for this group and to help transition into Will Levis if that's something that happens later on this season. But overall, I would say their biggest weakness is just kind of the wide receiver room. But if you add DeAndre Hopkins... Who better than a guy who completely dominates the 50-50 ball game like DeAndre Hopkins as an addition to the offense to not only help bolster that group, but help, you know, a guy like Traylon Burks, who didn't quite have the season you probably would have hoped for from a first-round selection last season. He did look good in some spots, but he's another guy that you could consider like a big 50-50 ball kind of guy. He's not going to necessarily wow you with blazing speed, but if you bring in a guy like D-Hop who can kind of take him under his wing while he's in a season of trying to maybe prove himself and earn that big money deal that Hopkins is looking for... I think that it would make an immediate upgrade to this group and a far more threatening team. And from the sounds of it, it seems like the Titans are the favorite right now to get DeAndre Hopkins. So if he lands there, that really puts the Titans in an excellent spot this season. So I know part of this ranking kind of has to do with like the potential of getting DeAndre Hopkins. Even without him, I think I'm still comfortable with them being over Tennessee or excuse me, over Indianapolis, just because again, the coaching is established. The system is established. You have some more stuff being changed over in Indianapolis with more questions I might like the receiver room more in Indianapolis, but overall, uh, I believe in what Mike Vrabel has going on over there. I think that Derrick Henry is still one of the best in the NFL coming off another strong season can help pound their way into a potential playoff spot. So I like the Titans at number two. And then to wrap things up, the team at number one, we are talking the Jacksonville Jaguars, a team that I would not be shocked to see win the AFC South come season end. Uh, I'm going to say this, and again, this I'm a Colts fan saying this, and it pains me to say this, it's the Jacksonville Jaguars at the top of this division, and I don't really think it's close. Doug Peterson came in and basically saved this franchise from a complete bottom out in what should be a great future going forward, but Urban Meyer damn near derailed that. Trevor Lawrence, it was like night and day from his rookie season to last year, and honestly, I look at last year kind of like his true rookie season because the mess that was left behind with Urban Meyer just kind of wrecked his confidence and almost like completely destroyed what could have poten could potentially be an excellent quarterback in the NFL for the next 15 plus years. And I firmly believe in Trevor Lawrence. I think he is the best in the South at the quarterback spot right now. And he's somebody who I would not be surprised being in the conversation of top five quarterbacks in the NFL as his career continues to progress. But you look at all the numbers and just some of the, you know, some of the quick things at face value completion percentage went up from 59 and a half percent to 66.3. He went touchdowns from 12 to 25 
doubled the number there, and that's just passing interceptions going down from 17 to 8, cutting the turnovers in half. His yards per attempt went up a whole yard from 6 to 7. It was very clear that he gained the confidence and looked more like the guy, and he made some really big-time throws last year in certain spots. I love what I saw from Lawrence last year. That was the guy I was expecting to see in year one. So now that we've gotten his second season like that, I'm hoping to see even more progression under Doug Peterson. Then you look at the receiver room and even the running back room as well. The receivers, though, if Calvin Ridley returns to form, or let's say he's only like 80% of what he was before, that is still a massive addition for this group here. Christian Kirk earning every penny that he got signed for last season. I remember everyone being naysayers about the contract he signed, and I was one of the very few that was not really against the whole signing. He was, it was like, everyone was saying, oh, he's never had a thousand yard season, but he was like... I don't even, it was like single digits off from a thousand yard season. So people were criticizing that and, oh, he'd never really been a number one because he was playing behind DeAndre Hopkins and whatever, but he clearly showed he can be a guy. And now that Calvin Ridley is coming into the fold, one of the better route runners, even one of the, like the top echelon of route runners in the NFL, because that is Calvin Ridley's game. He routes, he runs routes like some of the best in the NFL. Zay Jones If you want to call him an excellent number three, he is just that. Now that Calvin Ridley's in the fold, you have Christian Kirk. I guess he's the number three. And then Evan Ingram coming off of his best season since his rookie year. You have a ton of receiving threats to look forward to Jeffrey Lawrence throwing to here in year number three for him. And then in the backfield, Travis Etienne, who's just a complete dual threat. He had 1,400 yards from scrimmage last year. I would like to see some more touchdown production from him. He only had five, but overall, I mean, he is a guy that clearly showed his worth in his second year. I know a lot of people, even myself included, and I will completely, you know, blow my own spot up here. Uh, I wasn't too sure about Travis Etienne being paired with Trevor Lawrence. I know there was like this idea going around where everyone's like, oh, get the college wideout that your quarterback played with. And, you know, people were looking at looking at Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow being that example. And then you see Trevor Lawrence and his running back, Travis Etienne, being drafted together. I didn't necessarily think that that kind of worked in the same way as like getting a quarterback from a school and then bringing in his college wide receiver. But clearly there is chemistry there. And I'm sure that they're very comfortable having each other as the same guy working together in that offense. So you look at that plus tank Bigsby, six feet, 213 pound big man. Who's going to be like the one, two punch combination with Travis Etienne, And you are looking at an absolutely loaded team Altogether, I would like to see a little more improvement from the offensive line. But beyond that, I mean, like I said, the Jaguars are the number one team in the AFC South, in my opinion. And I don't really think it's very close. So best of luck to the rest of the South. I like the Jaguars at number one. But that is my power rankings for the offenses of the AFC South. Let me know in the comment section down below your power rankings, your thoughts and opinions on what I just discussed my opinions, my rankings, would love to discuss with you all in the comments. But that is it for me. If you made it to the end of the video, I greatly appreciate you all. I will see you all next time. Have a good one.